present truth. Friends, we are almost finished. We are on lesson number 28 tonight, about two more lessons, two or three. We would have brought this series to its close. Wow, what a journey. I never thought I could be able to write a Bible study. Um, I've always wanted to do one. Um, I've always used the amazing facts and so forth, but I was able to write my own and I give God all the praise and glory. We have the PowerPoints. We have the videos. Friends, you can take this. You can do it. I firmly believe that you can take these lessons and go and administer them. And we thank God for all those who are using them. Brother Twain Harrison down here in Portland and his wife and many others who are using them. And souls are being won by God's grace. The present truth is it biblical. Yes. 2 Peter 1.12 says that God wants us to be established in the present truth. And we believe that it is present truth that the flock needs now. This is what the world is dying, um, dying for. And the Adventist Church, we have it. We have the message. All we need to do is just, is just to go and share this message. Again, it is a series of truth, not a truth. Uh, each truth we've covered lays the foundation for the preceding or the succeeding truth. Right? And we have gone through majority, if not all, of these truths thus far. All right, we're in lesson 28 now. Um, a very important lesson, save to sin no more. Save to sin no more. Every lesson we go through, each, 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 each series, has an objective. And what, what's the purpose of the objective? It is to make sure that you, uh, your goal is focused and as you leave the house, you have accomplished the task you set out to be. And so the objective for lesson 28 is this now, right? Right, to define what, it, what Bible salvation is and to, uh, and to dismiss all the misconceptions surrounding this teaching. We want to ask, what is salvation? And we want to clarify all the misconceptions surrounding Bible salvation. Now, your handout says, now, there are many different ideas about how a person is to be saved. What does the Bible teach on this topic? The Bible is clear. We have only two choices regarding our sins. Either we'll pay for our sins in a lake of fire or we'll accept Christ's payment for them on the cross. Some Christians are confused about how the scriptures describe the experience of salvation. To better understand how God brings about our salvation, friends, we need to go to the Bible. That's where we want to go. Now, again, you won't be able to cover this lesson in its entirety tonight, right? You won't be able to cover it because, again, um, you know, there's a lot, but again, you're not, you're not on a time schedule. If you have to take two or three sessions, then go ahead. If you only get through one question, then no problem. Remember we said, friends, the nutrients, the nourishment one derives from his food is not so much based on the hasty consumption, but on its thorough digestion. So if you just go to one or two uh, questions and they grasp it, praise the Lord. When people join this church, we want them to be moved by an intelligent concept, uh, not by mere and sheer emotionalism. Now, again, there are several ways you can teach this subject, several angles you can come through. But again, who is our audience? Talk to me. Who are we aiming at? Put it in the chat group. Who are we administering the lessons to? We are not teaching Seventh-day Adventists. Our goal is to teach others who don't know this message. Our goal is the world. Our goal is those in paganism. These lessons are not written and designed for Seventh-day Adventists. And so there is a level of simplicity um, that is applied to them because people, these concepts are foreign to them. Again, so we've reduced it to pigeons, right? And so we written it in a very simple format, simple approach that you can receive it and teach it. Even a child or a teenager, even Ali can teach it. Right? Lizzie can teach it, or even Nathan, right? That's our goal, right? Now, question number one says now, salvation is divided into two major parts. What are they? So we've broken it up very, very simple now. The first part of salvation is this now. You want to emphasize, number one, it's God's part. Fill it in now, God's part. God has a part to play in regards to salvation. As a matter of fact, one of the first time the word salvation is mentioned in the Bible Look who is attached to it. In the book of Exodus, they have left the Red Sea, prodigious mountains on all sides. There is a Pharaoh behind them, Red Sea in front of them. They are hopeless. They are helpless. They are defenseless. Look what the Bible says now in Exodus chapter 14, 13. 
And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. There it is. When we think of salvation, we think of the Lord. The Lord has a part to play. God has a part to play. The Godhead has a part to play. Man has a part to play. And guess what now? Number two now, guess what now? God, man's part. Man's part. So there is God's part and there is man's part, right? And what is man's part? Oftentimes, again, when you see the salvation mentioned in the Bible, you oftentimes see man, um, man is required to do something. Acts chapter 16, verse 20. After the, 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 the prison, the, the jailer had beaten Paul and Silas with wounds and they began to sing and so forth. And he's convicted now of his wrong. And he cried out in verse 30. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You see, man has a part to play. So salvation has two parts. Very simple. God's part and man's part. Now, God will not do our part for us. And obviously, we can't do God's part for him. Now, again, we, you want to find beautiful illustrations to illustrate God working with humanity. And so here are a few that I have found. Um, they, 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 they tend to just drive the point home. Salvation is like this beautiful bird flying to its destination. But the bird has two wings. In order for the bird to fly um, accurately, correctly, he needs a right wing, he needs a left wing. And so we liken this bird as salvation. In order for salvation to take flight, brothers and sisters, you have to have two wings. What are they? The first wing, Ali, is what? Man's part. The second wing is God's part. Beautiful illustration. No bird can fly with one wing and salvation cannot work while either other parties are absent, right? One more illustration. Salvation can be likened to a man in a boat. As you ever gone in a boat, not an electrical boat, rowboat, you have oars. You have two oars. If you only use one oar, you go around in circles. Now, this man is going somewhere, friend. Salvation is taking us somewhere. But we need both rows. So one row, or rather run, one oar, represents man's part. The other oar symbolize God's part. Beautiful illustrations. You can elaborate on this. Man, this could, be, this could be studied all night. One more. It is likened unto salvation can be likened to a marriage. Right? Obviously, marriage in the context from the, from the um, Genesis definition, right? Male and female, right? And so you have um, male and female come together to form this beautiful thing, which is marriage. Marriage is a blessing. Are you with me? Right? And in order for marriage to be a blessing and not a benediction, right? what you need now, you need the husband to play his part, the husband to play his role, and the wife to play her role. You don't want to have a, 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 a Mr. Ma'am and a Ma'am Mrs. No, 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 no. Everybody must play their role and know their function for marriage to be beautiful. You can use these illustrations to just, just, just to metaphorically to describe what salvation is. Right now, note now, the word to save, to save, the term, to, the term save and salvation are sometimes used by the Bible writers to convey the idea of a person being delivered from danger or destruction. Go back to Genesis. They were delivered from Pharaoh's clutches. Often, though these terms refer to deliverance from sin, since death is caused by sin, people who are saved from sin have the hope of living forever. So the concept of salvation is, to be, is being delivered. Being delivered, the genesis, the origin, right? Being delivered from death, from fear. Are you with me? Now, so as we, as we, as we, as we break this down now, we've established salvation has two parts, God's part, man's part. Let's now focus briefly now on God's part. Now, when we think of God's part, we've condensed God's part, God's portion, into three major points. I've given you a litany of texts. You want to read these texts, expound upon these texts. Again, remember, you are not in a race. You're not in a rush. So if you only get through this, then so be it. Now, fill it in now. God's part now. God is, re is responsible for providing, fill it in now, the remedy for salvation, yes, the way to salvation, yes, 
and being able to sustain man while he is experiencing salvation. Wow, very simple. It is in God's part now. God is responsible for providing the remedy. We're going to talk about that for salvation. The way to salvation and being able to sustain man while he is experiencing or while he has experienced this beautiful thing that we know as salvation. Now, here are a few texts. I've given you six texts. And all these texts, if you read them clearly, carefully, you're going to see that they, they, the, the, these three points are conveniently couched in these three, in three, six texts. Ooh, three texts, right? The remedy, the way, and God's sustaining power. All right, let's look at it now. Hebrews chapter 9, 22, Paul says, And almost all things are by law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Oh, you see the blood, blood shedding, all right? Blood shedding, the remedy for sin. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission for sins, right? One more text, Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. Paul, Peter's preaching now on the day of Pentecost, and Luke says now, Be known unto you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you hold. Look at verse 11 now. And this, this is the stone to which the builder set at naught, which the builders, builders had become the head cornerstone. Here it is now. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among man whereby we must be saved. And what is that name? You see the three points now, right? Matthew chapter 121. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people, not in their sins or with their sins, or, you know, but from their sins. You see in the three points, right? Romans 10 verse 9 says now, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, Skip on to verse 10 now. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, friends. You see that? And one more text now that, that brings it home now, right? How, how does God sustain man in salvation, right? We've seen the remedy for salvation. You need blood. We see the way to salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, we, God now needs to sustain man through salvation while he has experienced salvation. Romans, uh, 1 John, not 1 John, John 1 verse 12. John says now, but as many as received him, who is the him? Jesus, to them gave he power to become sons of God. We see the three parts and the Bible, and I could have given you ample more text, Right? We see the remedy for salvation, we see the way to salvation, and we've discovered also God sustaining man while he's experiencing this wonderful thing known as salvation. Friends, you want to expound upon these three points, right? Note now, Christ came to earth to pay the price for our transgressions. No man who accepts Christ as his Savior and follow him need to suffer the wages of sin, the second death, eternal death. For Christ, God's sacrificial lamb, has died in his place. Through the new birth, God gives him power of a new life alley. Are you with me? Now, one of the most, part, one of the most beautiful statements ever written, in my opinion, on this whole concept of the, and you're going to find these three points, you're going to find it, the, 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 the remedy for salvation, the way to salvation, and God's sustaining man in the book, Desire of Ages, a powerful book, page 25. The author says, Christ was treated as we deserved, that we might be treated as he deserved. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified in his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. And friends, again, here we see the remedy for salvation, here we see the way to salvation, and here we see the sustaining grace in salvation all conveniently couched in Jesus. So that's man, that's God's part. God has his part. And friends, if we fail or fall, it's not because God has not done his part. More likely is because we are negligent in doing our part. 
So as you focus now on, on, on God's part, let's now transition on man's part. Man has a part to play. Man has a role to play in this whole thing called salvation. Now, man is responsible for the following things. If man is about, if man is about to experience salvation, number one, man, the, 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 uh, the, he, there must be a believing on Jesus Christ. Believe, and this belief is not just a casual belief. This belief has within it the germ of action. Let me say it again. This belief has within it the germ of action. If you believe a hurricane is coming, there are certain things you would do to prepare. Prepare. So again, elaborate on this. Acts sixteen thirty says now, and they said, "Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and all thy house." Man has to believe on Jesus Christ. That's the first step. Believe he's the son of God. Believe he died for you. Believe you have to believe on his name. That's the first step in man experiencing salvation. Man is also responsible now for a second thing now, confessing every known sin to Christ. Not to the priest or not to some pastor. You confess your sins to Christ in this order. Very, very simple. Right? 1 John 1, 9 says now, If we confess our sins, Ali, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, there has to be confessing. And as soon as we do the confessing, God does the forgiving. God will never cleanse a man who has not confessed his sins. And we are told, go to your rest at night. With every sin's confess. So when the voice comes, even though you are awake or even though waking or sleeping, you may go for with your with your lamps trimmed and burning, right? Second thing man has man's part in, involved in the whole thing of salvation. He must believe on Jesus Christ. He must confess every sin to Christ. Now, number two, now there must be a repenting of every sin. Now, why do we use the word confess and the word repent? Now when you confess, you, you speak. So why do we speak, right, if God knows everything? The speaking is not so much for God, it's more for you. You see, you need to understand and recognize that you did something wrong. So you're, when you're vocalizing it, you're saying, God, I, I recognize I did this. Confessing is more for you than for God because God knows everything. So as you confess, right, you confess. And when you confess, you want to be very, 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 very descriptive to God. Don't try to beat around the bush or to be very, very flowery. Be direct. Lord, I did it. This is why I did it. I'm not going to justify my action. And I'm going to be honest. If you don't help me, I'll do it again. Be honest. Be real. What is repenting now? Because if we confess, what, why do we have to repent? Now, repentance is what we call godly sorrow for sin. It's where we feel sorry Sorry, not so much for the consequence, but for the sin itself. So man has to repent. Here are some texts. Luke 3, Luke 13, 3. Luke says now, Nay, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Man has to repent of his sin. Sins, man has to feel sorry for his sins, right? One more text. We must, um, okay, repent of sins, right? Now, also now, once we repent of sins now, there, man must be willing to forsake every sin. It's one thing to confess a sin and to cling to a sin or to repent of a sin and still cling to it. Friends, we're going to have to be willing to forsake. And this is where salvation for many comes to a screeching halt. This is why many don't escalate up Jacob's ladder. We have to be willing to part with our sins. The Bible says, if your right hand offend you, chop it off, cut it off. If your eye offend you, Pluck it out. Use these texts. Are you with me? Now, Proverbs 28, 13 says now, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever, whosoever confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. Here it is, friends. Emphasize that, that there must be a forsaken, there must be a putting away of sin on man's part, or man will never experience the joy the true bliss, the boom, the blessing of this thing which we call salvation, right? 
One more thing, man, and there are several others we could have listed, but again, who's your audience? non symphony at Venice. We want to make it simple. We want to make it plain. Now, the, one of the last points we want to highlight now, right, is this now. Man must be willing to obey to be led by the Holy Spirit. You have to be willing to obey whatever God, wherever God says you're going to do it and be willing to obey the Holy Spirit. John 2 verse 5, the context is Jesus Christ is at a wedding and he's there minding his own business. They run out of wine and the mother comes to Jesus, do something. And he says to, the, to his mother, woman, my time has not yet come. And she's still persistent. And then she says to the servants now, this is important now, even though the context is wine, but for us now, his mother saith unto his servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Be willing to obey whatsoever God says. And friends, emphasize the fact. Up until this point, your candidate may not yet have been baptized. Drive it on. What is God telling you? God is speaking to your heart to get baptized. God is speaking to your heart to make a, a, a total commitment to him. Whatsoever he says, you're going to have to do it in the big things, even in the little things. It, they may rub you. Yeah, they may rub others. Whatsoever God says, you must do it. All right? Another thing now, being led by the Spirit, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 14 now, for as many as received, so far, sorry, for as many, uh, for as many are as led by the Spirit of God, Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So we must be willing to obey, be willing to be led by God. Friends, if we do not do these four, these six things on man's part, we will never experience the joy of salvation. Man has his part to play. Yes, God has his part to play. Note, to gain salvation, you must exercise faith in Jesus and demonstrate that faith by obeying his commandments. The Bible identifies Jesus as the source of salvation. Often referring to him as our Savior, God provides salvation from sin through the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The Bible refers to Christ as our Savior. However, now, there is there is is there more sorry is there a more important question man can ask than what must i do to be saved the story is told of a, a skeptical mathematics student found a note on which the table reading what will it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul he could not figure out any profit so he gave his heart to god after a man has found out what he ought to do to be saved, then he ought to act on that vital information and seek salvation from, for himself and for his dear ones. Friends, God has a part to play. Man has a part to play. God will not do for you that which you can do for yourself. Now let's transition now, right? Question two now. Can one lose out on salvation? This is another, now this is a, a segue into the next portion. Can one lose out? Of course. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by, by them that heard. That word neglect is a verb and it really means um, uh, to, not to give enough attention to. You see, we can neglect this concept of salvation by not giving due attention to. If we, were, if we would give more attention to our salvation than we give to Facebook and TikTok and all these other networks, friends, I guarantee you, you would be like Enoch, God would have took you. But we don't. And I tell folks this. You don't have to rob anybody, rape anybody, kill anybody, scam anybody to be lost. Just sit there and do nothing and you'll get there to hell. If we just neglect. It's a light word. Not give due attention to. Are you with me? One more text. One of the saddest texts in the entire Bible, I believe. Jeremiah 8 verse 20. Jeremiah says, now the harvest is past. And the summer has ended. And what's happened? We are not yet saved. In this text, there are three things Jeremiah, Jeremiah points out. The harvest alley. That's opportunities given. God has created a way by which every man can be saved. God has done his part. The harvest, 
opportunities given. The summer is ended. Opportunities miss. There it is. And the sad reality is we are not saved. We are not saved from the power of sin or from the presence of sin or from the guilt of sin. Yes, friends, we can miss out on salvation. And that is why it is imperative for us that today if we hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Press these points home to your student. No, yes, just as a person's uh, just as a person saved from drowning could fall or jump back into the water, a person who has been saved from sin can fall back and for, but fails to keep exercising faith could lose out on salvation. For this reason, the Bible urges Christians to have, who have received salvation to, 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 uh, to put up a hard fight, you know, to, to contend, to keep working and moving forward, to work out your salvation with fear and with trembling friends you have to bring these points home now again i i thought to probably do this part in a second point but again the problem is this now once you've established this point of salvation your student may be a studied christian meaning they are very familiar with some of the major concepts in christendom now one of the problems i have faced in my life as i have taught this Lesson on salvation. Very, very simple. I run into this question, which I get more and more out there, especially from Baptists, from Methodists, yes, from the more conservative Christian groups, not the um, non-denomination, because all they do is just sing and dance, most of them, right? But, but you have these hardcore Christians in the more orthodox congregation. One of the concepts you're going to have to understand is the concept between salvation versus predestination. Now again, I could have taught this in another lesson, but I really wanted to give it to you in a condensed version. Once you present the concept of salvation, you may be rebuffed by the concept of predestination. And so I want you to be ready to defend yourself if this concept makes its way in the study. Now, let me say this. Predestination is not salvation. As a matter of fact, let me say this, that predestination is the enemy of true salvation. It waters down, it dilutes the concept of salvation. Now, question number three says now, right? What about the concept of predestination? You know, it, 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 it is so sad that most of the challenges, Ali, most of the confusion that we have in Christendom comes because of the Apostle Paul's writing. It is, really. Most of the, the counteraction that we, we, we encounter as we teach the Bible studies usually come from people who don't understand the Apostle Paul's writing. Peter said, we know the text, the Apostle Paul wrote many hard things, technical things, which are hard to understand. And those which are unlearned, unlettered, they take these things and they rest it to their own destruction and even their own damnation, right? Now, Romans chapter 8, verse 29, and said, and I must be honest, because honesty is not just the best policy, it's the only policy. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't, I, I don't have a clue what the Apostle Paul is saying. I think I do, but I, I, I kind of stay away from the Apostle Paul because he's so technical. I'm going to admit to you, I really have not gotten the fullness from Romans 8, 29 and 30. But this I do know. I do know that this is not supporting predestination. I may not know what it means, but I, I know for a, a surety, this text is not supporting what they, are, what they think they're saying. So this is a text that they use now to support predestination. Now, bear in mind these are sincere people and you want to treat their, their objections kindly, respectfully. Right now, Romans 8, Ali now, right? Paul says now, For whom he did foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed in the image of his son, that he might be fashioned, be the firstborn rather, among many brethren. Verse 30 says now, Moreover, whom did he, whom did he, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, 
them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he will also glorify. Now, friends, just from a surface, you will think what, Ali, on in this text? What do you think of this text? That God has what? Yes, but what else? What is what is Lizzie? What is not not? God has favorites. That's what it, you think that He predestined some those whom He called. Now that's just a surface, no Holy Ghost interpretation. Paul is not saying that, and as a result, many have taken this text and built this mammoth of a doctrine known as predestination. Now, again, I'm going to give you the most simplest abbreviated form of predestination, which is the enemy to true salvation. Now, unfortunately, friends, when we think predestination, who do you think comes to our mind? So I say Satan. Yeah, that's true. But it is, it is the beloved, the Protestant, the Protestant reformer, John Calvin, the Frenchman from Geneva. Now, again, we're not here trying to disparage the legacy of John Calvin. God used John Calvin greatly in Geneva. Um, he's in the Great Controversy. He did some wonderful things. But like most of the Reformers, they never had all of the light. And that's why God told them on the Sardis, I will put no other burdens upon them. Right? John Calvin, Ali, is the one who formed the doctrine of predestination. You ought to know that, right? It's John Calvin. Now, note now, the roots of this teaching, predestination, goes back to the giant of the Protestant Reformation, John Calvin. This man of deep faith was a sincere Bible student, a brilliant scholar. But like all people, including Martin Luther and John Wesley, his theology was not perfect, right? It's said... It's been said that great men often hold great heresies, which is true. I believe this was true of Calvin, who attempted to, to uh, systematize the concept of salvation, which, from, which formed the basis of Calvinism. So when you think predestination, you think John Calvin, and you think Calvinism. I mean, Calvinism and predestination is a hallmark of Calvinism. Almost every Calvinist are... are believe in predestination. Spurgeon was a Calvinist, believe it or not, and Spurgeon believed in predestination, right? The great Spurgeon and many, many others of that, that time frame. Now, let's break it down, all right? Because again, your student may ask you, what about predestination? And they're going to take you to Romans 8 to, to put their point. Now, note now, as a result, some denominations teach based on, here it is now, Romans 8, 28, 29, that Paul is asserting that before the world was created, God predestined some people to be saved, the elect, Ali, there it is now, and the rest to continue in their sins and therefore to be damned, consigned to eternal burning fire for hell. Human choice, human choice, it asserts, plays no role in salvation. In other words, if God says you're going to be lost, then you're damned. There's nothing you can do about it. Predestined. And for some people, he has predestined them for heaven. So it doesn't matter what, what they do, they're going to be saved. And there's some, it doesn't matter what they do, they're going to be lost. That is diabolical. And I'm going to show you now. When we think of predestination now, there are five key points to it. You got to get this, saints. You got to know this. Because if you teach salvation, you will encounter the counteraction, which is predestination. Are you with me, friends? Right? It shows favoritism, right? Exactly. Right? All right? Now, there are five points, Ali. You got to get this, Ali, because you may encounter this at school. Five points, right, that John Calvin asserts now. Number one, the first one is total depravity. That's a big word. No, total depravity, total depraved. That is, all people are born, are, are born with, 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 with the propensity to sin, sinners. The idea, now this idea is taught in Scripture. So the first part of predestination is correct. Total depravity. Let that man is depraved. It means there's nothing good in man. There are some who teach, oh, man has a, a bad brain but a good heart. Nothing about man is good. Everything. Here are the texts that supports Total depravity. Now, again, I do agree with this. Here it is now, right? Here are some texts now. 
The wicked, Psalms chapter 58 verse 3 says now, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born. Friends, man don't go bad. We are born bad. Man don't have an expiration date. We'll expire at age 12. Total depravity, right? One more text. Job 14 verse 4 says now, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Who? That's mankind. That's humanity. Man is unclean. They can make themselves clean. That's the doctrine that those texts support total depravity. Now, this one drives it home. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Isaiah says, why? Why should he be stricken anymore? He will revolt more and more. Here it is now. Ali, the whole head is sick. The whole heart faint. From, from the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. That is man. Man has a depraved heart. He has a depraved will, a depraved mind, depraved feeling. From the top of his head to his big toe, man is utterly and totally depraved. I believe in that. I believe in that concept. Total depravity. Even the newborn baby is depraved. Jeremiah 23, verse 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Michael Jackson tried it, but it didn't work. More and more guys are bleaching, but you know what? If they die, it's going to say they die black, right? The leopard is spots. That, that, then may he do good who is accustomed to do evil. You can't. Even the good we do is tainted with selfishness, wickedness. You see? And we do good that evil may come sometimes, right? We do evil that good may come. So we are depraved. These texts support the doctrine of total depravity. Now again, the Bible supports that part. But this is where now I disagree with predestination. Number two now, right? Unconditional election. Unconditional election. Which teaches, the second part of predestination now, that God himself has chosen who will be saved, and who will be lost. This point is contrary to Scripture. Now, God knows all things. The Lord doesn't arbitrarily choose who he will to be saved or lost. Here are some texts that dismantle unconditional election. Right? 1 Timothy 2.4 For this is the good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, for God will have all man, you see it, unconditional, right, unconditional, uh, all men, unconditional election teaches that God has appointed some man to be saved. But Paul says God wants all man to be saved. You see that? One more text that dismantles, right, unconditional election now. Is this now Revelation 22, 17? And the spirit and the bride say, come. Who's coming? Who's he calling? Let him that at thirst say, Come. Let him, him that thirst will come. And whosoever will. He didn't say those whom God have unconditionally elected. Whosoever will, let them come. Powerful text to dismantle the second point of predestination, right? One more text. We love it now. John 3 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever. Whosoever mean whosoever. Drunkard, murderer, gay, straight, bi, tri, trans, LMNOP, whatever you are. Whosoever. Rich man, poor man, black man, white. And whosoever. Whether you're documented, undocumented. Whosoever. Trump, whosoever. <laughs> um, Kamala Harris, who, whosoever. These texts dismantle the concept of unconditional election right and we do not believe in that right now the third thing now the third part of predestination is this now right limited atonement when we say limited it means we don't have a lot atonement means to to, to pay for one's sins it teaches that jesus died to redeem only those who were pre-chosen the elect not everyone this point, again, is contrary to scriptures, friends. You see what damage this done to sal does to sal salvation? He said God has favorites, right? Limited atonement, what? The, meaning when Christ died on Calvary, 
his blood couldn't, couldn't cleanse everybody, only a select few, which is totally, totally wrong, right? Here are some texts now. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, Paul says now, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one die for all, then we're all dead. Then he says now, that he died for all. This dismantled the concept of unlimited atonement. Christ died for all. Christ died for everybody. Again, these are some of the hallmarks of what we call predestination. Try to simplify it to you, right? Now, the fourth part as of, of it now is this now, right? And one more text we can use. Revelation 2.20 says now, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, any man, this dismantled the concept of unlimited atonement, right? Number four now, the irresistible grace. Yes, these are parts of predestination. And there are many Christians who say they have experienced salvation believe this, which says humans are saved only by God's will with no choice or part on their own, right? So, in other words, I don't have to do nothing God's part save me. Again, this is not true. That's not true. Hebrews chapter, irresistible grace, Hebrews chapter 3, 15, Paul says now, while it is today, today I say, if any man, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Once he does his part, don't resist, don't repulse, don't refuse, saints. You see, man doing his part, God his part. Revelation 3, 20, another text. Right? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and what? They have to open the door. You see, it didn't say God opens the door and come in. The man has to open the door, open his heart, give his will to God. So this dismantles the concept of irresistible grace, meaning that God does his part. And man does not have to do his part, right? Now, the fifth part now to the concept of predestination is now perseverance of the saints, which states that those who are predestined to be saved cannot be lost, even by their own choice. Once you are saved, you're always saved. You will never lose your salvation. This point, again, is contrary to Scripture. This falls under the concept of perseverance of the saints. Bible dismantles this. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul is a saved man. Paul is preaching, Paul is teaching. And Paul has said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Look what Paul says now about himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 27, But I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, Ali, I have what? Preached to others, and myself should be what? A castaway. Does this sound like eternal safety? No. Paul says, if I don't keep my body, if I don't pray and do what I have to do, I can preach and be lost. This dismantles the concept that, 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 that Calvin brought forth of perseverance of the saints, which says, once saved, never lost. This is a prominent teaching in Christianity. And I'm going to, be, I'm going to say it. There are even some Adventists who believe like this, unfortunately. And they live like it, right? So, this is a nutshell. Things you may encounter. So when you hear predestination, you know the text that they come from, who is the author of it, and the five major points. Now, again, I could have gotten more technical, but that's not the place. Now, one of the things that you always get, once you dismantle the concept of predestination, they always bring this to you, right? As we wind up, question number four says now, what about, what about Pharaoh? Wasn't he predestined to be lost? Right? Now, this is the text they use now. They go to Exodus um, 9, verse 12. And the Lord, there it is, he hardened Pharaoh's heart. There it is. The Lord, why would the Lord do that? That is predestination. The Lord predestined Pharaoh to be lost, so he hardens Pharaoh's heart. Now again, 
after you've covered everything else, there, there has to be some correct explanation. No, 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 right? No. God did God did God make Pharaoh's sorry, did God make Pharaoh stubborn so he could not use him to teach Israel a lesson? Did Pharaoh have a choice whatsoever in, in whether or not his own heart was could be hardened? Keep in mind there are several other verses that indicate Pharaoh hardened his own heart. They never read these other verses. They only read Exodus chapter 9, verse 12. So did God make him stubborn? No. Did God purposely harden his heart? It sounds like predestination. But look at these texts now. Exodus chapter 12, verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. He hardened his own heart. What does that mean? One more text. And, and, and you find this all through the Bible. The narrative. Exodus 8.32. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. At this time, neither would he let the people go. God is appealing to Pharaoh. You see, God is doing his part through his servant. Pharaoh is refusing the signs, refusing the admonition. And each time... He refuses God's instructions. He becomes more, more self-bent in his own, confined in his own stubbornness. One more. Exodus 9.34. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and he hardened his heart. He hardened his own heart. And as a result, now God just left Pharaoh alone and gave him up to himself. Note then, note as we wind down, note then. How did Pharaoh's heart become hardened, Ali? I believe God sent circumstances to Pharaoh in order to soften his heart. But the repeated warning given by Moses were ignored by the Egyptian leader. Every time another manifestation of God's power came upon the land, Pharaoh refused to listen and his heart, and his heart by his own choice, became more and more what? Hardened. If he had not, sub if he had but submitted to God's messages, his heart would have been become soft, pliable, teachable. Think of the warm sun that shines on the earth. If you will set a lump of clay and a lump of wax beside, side by side, underneath uh, the both same beaming light, one would become hard and the other would what? Melt. Pharaoh chose to be like the clay. When God appeals came to the proud ruler, God's light hardened his heart because he refused. Are you with me? Predestination teaches that God arbitrarily decides who will be saved and who will be lost. In other words, Pharaoh simply would have had no choice but to be lost. It indirectly teaches that God, that the Lord chooses for some people in sin, but in doing so, it, it makes him an accessory to sin. Powerful point. Watch it now. Instead of offering to save you from sin, predestination presents a God who stands back and allows you to struggle with sin. This is a dangerous belief because it distorts the compassion character of God who poured out all of heaven to save us. God does not harden people's heart. He is desperate to save everyone. As a matter of fact, look at this powerful text. Ecclesiastes 33, 11, the Bible says, Say unto them, Ezekiel, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked will turn from his way and live. Turn he, turn he, turn he and live. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Friend, that does not sound like predestined. That sounds like God has provided the remedy and the way and the solution for salvation. Note then, he sends us truth to help us move in the right direction. It is the rejection of his message that makes us resistant to light of heaven. When people repeatedly turn away from the appeals of God's agencies, such as Pharaoh did, it is then that they become 
resistant, hardened like the clay to the further convicting cause of the Holy Spirit, friends. Are you with me? Emphasize this to your student. Again, you will not cover this in an hour. Trust me. But again, you do, you're not rushing. You want to make sure that when you leave your student, they have a correct understanding of salvation and they're not confused by one saved, never lost, which is a part of predestination. Spurgeon says, The more the sun which melts, sorry, the same sun which melts wax hardens the clay. And the same gospel which melts some persons to repentance harden others in their sins. A powerful statement. And it came from a man who, who, who believed in predestination. Wow. But my point is, friends, that is the gist of predestination, right? As a church, we don't believe it. And let me say this. The Bible does not support predestination. Now, again, whatever Romans chapter 8, 29, 8, 20, 29 says, and I may not have gotten the fullness of it, this I do know, that text is not supporting the concept of predestination. Now, again, the reason why we included this little bit in the lesson, because, again, you'll find people out there who they are Calvinist, and one of the hallmarks of the Calvinist teaching is the whole concept of predestination. Again, as we close, is predestination and salvation the same thing? By no means, friends. I believe one was invented by the devil and one was invented by God. And they are at war. One uh, brings clarification. The other brings distortion. And the other brings confusion. Now, once you're finished, again, as we've discussed in every lesson, you want to hold your student to the appeal. Very simple. Do you understand what was taught tonight? Yes, and if they, they do, you have them check their appeal cards. And if they do not, okay, Tom, what portion of the lesson did you not understand? Again, friends, you're not rushing. This is not a rush. You may not get through this lesson, but more than probably three or four sessions. Take your time because the whole objective is to make sure that your student understand the lesson and so they can make an intelligent stand in the remnant church. Friends, I say this. There has to be a paradigm shift in the church for the work to be done. The same way the work started is the same way the work will finish, house to house. And the quicker we as a people get this concept and start now to implement in ways where we can seek to mobilize our con congregants to go out and give Bible studies, is the sooner and nearer the work will be Finished. It will not be finished by somebody sitting behind a camera and these hot lights, right? You know, reading and you just sitting at home. Some of you guys are in your bed, in your pajamas. Some of you guys are eating. Some of you guys are multitasking. That's not how the work will finish. All of us will have to get involved, young and old. Every member of the church should be taught how to give Bible readings, how to give Bible studies. So, friends, I want to encourage you as we bring this series to a close, invest in your binders. Get the PowerPoints. We are a little bit del um, delinquent in mailing them out because we're backed up, but I promise we, we, we will get them out by the grace of God this week. So all those who have uh, requested them will get them and you can use them, friends. I encourage you, use this lesson. Now, this is not the end and all and be all. If you're using something else, praise God. This is just an alternative. Now, the difference between this and other lessons is that, number one, you have your binder. You have your master guide, you have your study student guide, you have the PowerPoints, Mercy, and you also have the videos. You can go back and get the concepts behind these doctrines, and so you can go and teach it to others. All right, um, Brother Clay says the, to the concept of total depravity, as taught by Augustine and Calvin, had to do with the original sin. Original sin is the loss of the image of God. Exactly. It was a doctrine that came from Augustine, right? All right. All right. Billy, Billy says it shows favoritism. It does, because if God predestines some, then he definitely has favoritism. He has grandkids, and God doesn't have grandkids. Again, John 3, 16, whosoever. Excellent point. And there are many other texts that we could use um, to support the concept, but I think I've given you enough. 
All right, Saints, I want to thank you again. You know, we started late, so we had to just kind of move through as quick as possible. We thank you for, for logging on, um, all those who came on online, and all those who will um, view this at a, a, later, a later date. Friends, I say, make the most of the opportunity. Because soon and very soon, we won't have this platform or any platform like this. And so while we have liberty, while the angels are holding back the four winds, may God help us to strengthen the Bible says iron sharpeneth iron. May God help us to sharpen each other in the truth for these last days. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, O God, again, just for the clarity of your word and for the simplicity of salvation. We're so thankful, dear God, that we who have experienced salvation, we want others to experience it also. We thank you that God has done his part by providing the remedy and the way and the sustaining power in salvation. Help us, O oh God, to do our part, to look to Jesus, to confess our sins, to repent of our sins, O oh God, uh, and also, Lord, to, con to, to, to forsake our sins and to be willing to be led by Jesus. And whatsoever he bids us, may we do it. Give us all a good night's rest, we pray, as we enter a new week. We plan to encounter new challenges, new obstacles, new trials, new tests, new temptation. Um, so we need new grace. We need new mercies. May you watch over us all and bring us here back at the appointed time. These mercies we ask in Jesus' name and we say amen, amen.